Well, we have been studying in this Sunday school about the end times. We are having, we are looking at a brief overview of the end times, the events that are going to take place in the very near future. So far, we have, uh, well, we, what we have been doing is we have been studying Matthew 24 in comparison with Revelation 6 and other parts of scripture. And we are trying to see what God has said in the word about the end time events, about the last things, the last events of this world. We have seen that the next great event in God's calendar is the rapture of the church, the uniting of the bride with the bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. And after that, we have seen begins what is called the tribulation. And we have seen that this tribulation can be divided into two parts. It's a seven year tribulation called the time of Jacob's trouble. We have seen that already, that as soon as the church is raptured, as soon as the church is raptured up, then the tribulation begins here. And the tribulation is at least as uh, the actual time of Jacob's trouble Daniel's 70th week is seven years for sure. But like we, get, we have seen, there could be a three year period before the actual tribulation begins. But again, now that we cannot say with 100% uh, confidence that it's going to be like that. But there is a possibility that after the church is raptured and before the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, there would be a 10 year period but the 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 last week in daniel 70 uh, weeks prophecy the 70th week of daniel is seven years for sure and these seven years are divided into three parts three and a half years and three and a half years and we have seen that the first three and a half years are called the time of, uh, or, or the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of sorrows. The first three and a half years, Jesus calls them the beginning of sorrows. And the second half of the tribulation is called the great tribulation, the great tribulation. And at the end of the great tribulation is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the millennial reign of Christ. The millennial reign of Christ, which Jesus Christ establishes at the second coming. We're going to study a little bit more about that, the Lord willing. But right now I want you to just see that we are having an overview. We are looking at the main events. We are not getting into the details as of now. We are just trying to build a frame, a framework through which we can understand the last things. <coughs> so you have the tribulation which is divided into the beginning of sorrows and the great tribulation. And we have seen some of the things that take place in the first part of the tribulation and in the second part of the tribulation. And we have seen that at the end of the great tribulation, Jesus Christ physically returns to the earth with the saints. We have read about it in Matthew chapter 19. Now let us go back once again to Matthew chapter 24. Uh, sorry, Revelation chapter 19. We had seen uh, that Jesus comes back riding on a white horse with armies of saints following him from heaven. And today we're going to go back and look at what is going to happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ. So. For some reason, the Lord Jesus Christ left out this, uh, this particular event which would take place at his second coming in his narrative in Matthew chapter 24. I do not know the reason why he did not mention this because he gave us so many other details about the tribulation and the second coming in Matthew 24 and 25. But for some reason, he leaves out this particular incident <coughs> And we are going to look at other parts of scripture to see what exactly is going to happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Turn with me please to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16 and we'll read verse 16. 
Revelation 16, 16. And he gathered them, the, them together into a place called in the Hebrew town, Armageddon. Armageddon. Now Armageddon, everybody talks about the war of Armageddon. And Armageddon is actually firstly the name of a place in Israel. And at this place, Jesus Christ fights a great war. Armageddon. It's called the war of Armageddon and when Jesus Christ comes back to the earth with the armies of heaven following him, the first thing he does is fight a war. In fact, the Lord willing, sometime I would like to do a Bible study on uh, the route of the second coming. The route which the Lord Jesus Christ takes at the second coming because he's not going to just come from heaven and then land there in Israel. That's not how it's going to be. Before he sets foot on the Mount of Olives at the second coming, there is a lot of work that the Lord accomplishes. That is, he's going to go and destroy a lot of his enemies. And there is a particular route mentioned in the Bible. And if you search the scriptures, you will find it. What direction the Lord Jesus Christ goes in when he comes back. You know, he goes to Egypt, he goes through Saudi Arabia, he goes through Jordan. So there is a particular route there and the Lord willing, we are going to do a Bible study on that. It's going to be very interesting. And so when he comes back, he comes back to fight a war. That's the main thing that you must understand. He is not coming back, like we've said, as the meek and lowly Jesus. He's not coming back as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He's coming back as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's coming back as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So it says that he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now, there are other names by which this place is called. Sometimes it's called Megiddo. That's also the same place. Megiddo, the Valley of Megiddo or other such things. Now let's look at Revelation 19 and verse 15. Revelation 19 verse 15 says, this is again talking about the second coming. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Look at these things. When he comes back riding on a horse, he comes with a sharp sword which comes out of his mouth and he smites the nations with it. He rules them with a rod of iron and then importantly he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Well, you really don't want to be an enemy of Jesus Christ when he comes back the second time. If you are not a born again Christian, it doesn't matter how good you are. You are an enemy of Jesus Christ. If you are not a part of the body of Christ, then you are outside uh, it and the wrath of God abides on you. So you don't want to be his enemy here at the second coming if you last through the tribulation. Because when he comes back, he's going to tread the winepress of his fierceness and wrath. What a horrible thing it's going to be. The Bible gives a lot of details about it. Uh, look at Revelation. <coughs> Sorry. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 20. Revelation 14 verse 20. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Thousand six hundred furlongs. That's how the blood flows on the streets when he comes and treads the winepress of his wrath, the winepress of his anger. Look at also Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah 63. And we read verses 1 to 6. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. You see, this is a reference to Revelation chapter 19, when Jesus Christ comes traveling on a horse. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. That's Jesus Christ speaking. 
Again, the question is asked of Jesus. Wherefore art thou in thine apparel? Uh, wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, Jesus says, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to, be, uh, to, to, to uphold. Therefore my own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in my anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. This is how Jesus Christ is coming back. This time is going to be a time of vengeance. Vengeance. Vengeance against whom? Against everyone who has rejected Jesus Christ. Against everyone who hated him. Against everyone who have uh, persecuted and killed his people. He's going to pour out his anger, his wrath, his fury upon not only the Antichrist and the false prophet, but against all the inhabitants of the earth. We have seen that he does it against the nations. Well, mainly, of course, it's going to be against all those men from various nations who join the army of the Antichrist and besiege Jerusalem at that time. At the time of the second coming, Jesus Christ comes back at the moment when there is no more hope for Jerusalem. The Antichrist and his armies would have surrounded Jerusalem right from Megiddo to probably to Basra. That's how uh, many would be there in the army of the Antichrist surrounding Israel and Jerusalem, ready to destroy. Then suddenly Jesus Christ comes back and destroys all the enemies of Israel and establishes his kingdom. Now look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah 25. We'll read verses 30 to 33. Jeremiah 25, 30 to 33. Therefore prophesy thou against all these words and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high, and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth, and the slain of the Lord shall be at that day, from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried, they shall be dung upon the ground. Look at the strong language, which most Christians don't like, right? They are all this God loves you crowd. We call them the God loves you crowd. They never dare to speak about these things. They have a lopsided view of God. They always talk about the love of God. Love one another, care for one another, share with one another, all those kind of things. But they fail to, uh, to speak about the thing that most glorifies God. That is the establishment of His Son Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords here on the earth. The same evil world, wicked world, which rejected his son will one day bow down their knees before him and worship him and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. It's going to happen. And that is the greatest event in God's calendar. A lot of very pious Christians think the cross is the greatest event in God's calendar. In your calendar and mine, if we are born again Christians, the cross is the greatest event in our lives. Not in God's. Not in God's eyes. Why would the time when his son was humiliated and put through such excruciating pain and a shameful death 
Why would that event be the greatest event in God's eyes? Just because he did that to save you. No, it's not. It was the humiliation of his son. That's not the greatest event in his eyes. The greatest event in God's eyes is the exaltation of his son, Jesus Christ. The coronation of his son as king of kings and lord of lords. That's what is the greatest event in God's calendar. And it's coming very soon. Praise God. But in this passage that we have read, you see, it says the sword will go from one nation to the other. And the slain of the Lord will be from one end of the earth to the other. You see, all the people who would have taken the mark of the beast here in the tribulation would probably be slain when Jesus Christ comes back. In Armageddon, he kills the armies of the Antichrist. But that's not all. He is going to uh, smite the nations. All the wicked of the earth who have rejected him. Remember, if you read in the book of Revelation, it says, in spite of all the judgments that God sends upon the earth, there would be some people who would still not repent and who would blaspheme the name of God. In spite of all the pain and suffering they would be going through, they would blaspheme the name of God. So you can imagine what Jesus Christ is going to do when he comes back to the earth with, with such people. He's not going to deal with them in mercy anymore. The time of mercy is over. The time when God deals with mankind in mercy and grace is here in the church age that we are living in. <coughs> and one that's, once that time is passed, God's going to deal, them, uh, deal with them in vengeance. The Bible is very, very clear about that. Now, there are a few other passages that I would like to show you. Um, please. Please turn to first, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 1. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. And we will read... Verse 6 onwards. Verses 6 to 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 to 10. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So the Bible repeatedly talks about the terrible vengeance with which the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. You can imagine this right from the beginning of this world, when God created and made Adam and Eve, Right from those days, men have been rejecting God. Men have been blaspheming the name of God. Men have been showing their fist in the face of God. Men have been saying, we don't need you, God. They have hated him for no reason. They have rejected his offer of love and he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for the sins of all mankind. They trampled underfoot the precious blood of Jesus Christ by rejecting him. And you can imagine that cup of fury that is in God's hand, the cup of wrath must be full and overflowing and God would be ready to pour it out. <clears throat> and he does so in the tribulation. But when he comes back, he's going to once for all put an end to all uh, the opposition that he's been had for the last 6,000 years of this world. That's how it's going to be at the end of the tribulation. Now look at Judges chapter 5. Judges chapter 5 and verse 19. Judges 5, 19. <clears throat> the kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. Now this is, of course, talking about Deborah and Barak and how they fought with the king of Canaan, Jabin, and his uh, commander, Sisera. But all this is a beautiful picture of the second coming of Jesus Christ. In fact, if you read some of these things, 
you will have no doubt in your mind. Look at verse 10. Speak ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment and walk by the way. That looks like a direct reference to Revelation chapter 19 where those armies uh, of heaven follow the Lord Jesus Christ on white horses. Look at verse 20. Uh, it says, they fought from heaven, the stars in their courses fought against his era. That didn't happen really. In the Old Testament, it's certainly a picture of what is going to happen at the second coming. Sisera is a good type of the Antichrist. So they fought from heaven. It's the armies that come back with Jesus Christ that fight from heaven. As I've said, if you study the root of the second advent of Jesus Christ, he is riding on a horse, but his horse is not on the ground. He's still flying. There are many references that you can look up and uh, it's very, very interesting to study that. So he fights from heaven along with the armies that follow him. Uh, that's a good picture of what's going to happen at the second advent of Jesus Christ. A, a, a few more verses before we move forward. Look at Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12. For those of you who are not very familiar with the order of books in the Old Testament, Zechariah would be the second last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah 12 verses 2 to 4. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Now this is what we are talking about. There will be a siege against Judah and Jerusalem before Jesus Christ returns. In the first three and a half years of the tribulation, the Antichrist is good towards Israel. Remember, he makes a covenant for seven years. He makes a covenant with Israel. But in the middle of the week, he breaks the covenant. And uh, the abomination of desolation is set up. The abomination of desolation is set up by the Antichrist. But begins by the great red dragon, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. So you'll read about it in the book of Revelation. And in the second half of the tribulation, Israel becomes the greatest enemy, not only of the Antichrist, but of the whole world, the unsaved world. So by the end of the tribulation, the armies of the Antichrist besiege Judah and Jerusalem in order to destroy everybody in it and to take over because the devil's greatest desire is <clears throat> to set up his king on Mount Zion in Jerusalem to rule the world. Just as it is God's desire to set up his king to sit on the throne of David and rule the earth. That's exactly what the devil desires and that's what he will try to do. He will try to completely wipe out the Jews and rule the earth from Jerusalem. But Jesus Christ comes back. So he is not successful in doing that. Look at verse 3. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. See that? Though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. Uh, it looks like most probably, especially in the book of Revelation, the, the army of the Antichrist would come riding on horses to besiege Jerusalem. And they say, uh, in nowadays, like never before in the past few hundred years, nations have been breeding horses in the millions. Must be getting ready for Armageddon, that's why. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. And I will open my eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And that's what happens. First, uh, he comes back and he starts attacking the armies of the Antichrist. Look at verses 8 and 9 of the same chapter. <clears throat> In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day <coughs> sorry, shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord uh, before them. We'll also read verse uh, 9. 
And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Nations come against Jerusalem. Look at verse 11. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hannah Drimmon in the valley of Megiddon. You see that all this happens at Armageddon in the valley of Megiddon or Megiddo as it's called sometimes. So we have seen various verses in the Bible in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament which talk about a great uh, outpouring of God's wrath at the second coming of Jesus Christ. For, for seven years, God has been punishing the earth, judging the earth with various judgments. But at the second coming, he sums it all up by killing the army of the Antichrist. Look at Joel chapter 3, verses 9 to 12. Joel. Joel is a very interesting book when it comes to the study of the last days. Joel chapter 2. Sorry, Joel chapter 3, verses 9 to 12. <clears throat> Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about thither. Cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. The second uh, greatest event at the second coming of Jesus Christ is something that is called the judgment of nations. The judgment of of nations takes place at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now this judgment that we have just read about in uh, uh, Joel chapter 3 is said to be in the valley of Jehoshaphat <clears throat> and it says Jesus Christ will judge the whole world there in the valley of Je uh, Jehoshaphat and uh, this is also something that is mentioned by the Lord in the book of Matthew chapter 25. Remember in Matthew chapter 24, you have the tribulation as well as the second coming of Jesus Christ from Matthew 24 verse 31 onwards to the end of the chapter. There is a description of the second coming and the post-tribulation rapture that takes place at the second coming. And we are going to go back and look at a few things there if we have the time today. But now, look at Matthew 25. Matthew 25, we'll read verse 31 onwards a few verses from verse 31 when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats and he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left so he's going to come to judge the nations and he's going to, well, it's not going to be a judgment where, you know, whole nations get saved. It's not going to be like that. The judgment will be on an individual basis, but it will be a judgment of all the people of the world. All the nations of the earth will be gathered together before Jesus Christ and he's going to separate individuals into two groups, sheep. And goats. A lot of Bible teachers teach this uh, in a different way. They say there will be some sheep nations and there will be some goat nations. No, that's not what the Bible says at all. That's not how Jesus Christ is going to divide the sheep and the goats based on the, uh, the nationality or based on which nation uh, has been good and which nation has been bad towards Israel. That's not how it's going to be. It's going to be on an individual basis. In a nation, the people who have blessed the Jews and have done good things for Jesus Christ, those are the ones who will enter into the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. Those are the sheep. But in the same nation, there might be others who have hated the Jews and persecuted them, killed them, uh, 
or you know have not done anything for the Lord Jesus Christ in the sense that they have not only not professed faith in him but even if they profess faith in him they may have taken the mark of the beast so they, those are the goats you have judgment of nations but it is going to be judgment of individuals in those nations and look at this look at uh, verse 34 then shall the king say unto them on his right hand come ye blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world so the most important thing when jesus christ comes back is the kingdom remember that it's the throne of david on which he's going to sit that's the most important thing and he says to these sheep uh, individuals to enter into the kingdom the millennial, the millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ now look at uh, verse 40 you know they say to him Lord why do you say this that you know you were naked and we clothed you you were hungry we fed you you were thirsty we gave you water when all these things Jesus answers in verse 40 and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Now for those of you who have absolutely no idea what I am talking about, in verse 34, Jesus said to the sheep, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But why is Jesus Christ asking the sheep to enter the millennium? And to ask a more uh, simple question, on what basis does Jesus Christ divide the sheep and the goats? Who are the sheep and who are the goats? And in verse 40, uh, in verse 35, he says, he gives us the reason. For I was an hungered and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, he gave me drink. I was a stranger and he took me in and he goes on. And then in verse 40, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. The brethren of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the brethren are always the Jews. The brethren of Jesus Christ are the Jews, remember that. Even at the first coming of Jesus Christ, they were his brethren. So what Jesus is saying is that those who have done the uh, least bit of service to the Jews in the tribulation would enter the millennial kingdom. But the thing that I want you to see here is the works-based salvation that Jesus Christ is talking about. Works and faith in the tribulation that's what we have always taught works salvation is not the same in all the, the, the various ages of dispensation salvation is not the same in the church age remember it is faith plus nothing it is grace it is by grace through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ Faith in what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. That's what gets us saved in this church age. No works, no good works, nothing can save us. But we do good works after we get saved. But in the tribulation, salvation is by faith and works, just as it was under the, uh, in the Old Testament under the law. It was faith plus works. In the Old Testament under the law and before the law it was something else well, that's not the subject of our study but I'm just helping you to see this that the basis of this salvation in the tribulation is faith and works they believe in Jesus Christ but they also show it with their works just like James talks about it in James chapter 2 a lot of Bible teachers like John MacArthur try you know in order to prove the doctrine they believe in twist and rest the scriptures like James chapter 2 to make it teach something that it does not teach James chapter 2 clearly talks about justification by works Martin Luther the great reformer saw that so clearly that he rejected the book of James he said 
this book of James should not be in the Bible because it is uh, in uh, stark contrast or in uh, contradiction to the writings of Paul. Paul says justification is by faith alone, in Christ alone. And that was the theme of the Reformation. Martin Luther preached justification by faith. But, he, but when he read the book of James, in chapter 2, he reads that justification is by works. He thought, because of the limited light God had given uh, Christians in those days, he thought the book of James must be a mistake. You know, it should not be added to the canon of scripture. He thought it should be removed because it is in contradiction to Paul's writings about salvation by faith alone. But men like John MacArthur Jr., I'm talking about that Bible teacher who always talks about Greek and Hebrew. This guy and others like him, instead of taking the Bible as it is and rightly dividing it and rightly applying it, take James and try to and force it to apply to the Christian in the church age by changing the words and by uh, you know going to the Greek and doing such things. You don't have to do that. James is correct. Paul is also correct. Paul is writing to the church age. Justification is by faith alone in the church age. James is writing in a transitional period uh, from the church age to the tribulation. And it's tribulation doctrine that you find in James chapter 2. Salvation is by faith and works. Justification is uh, by faith and that faith is evidenced by works. And without that, those works, that person is considered not saved. Just like Jesus Christ says in Matthew 25, just what we have seen now. He says, if you have done this, what is that? works. If you have given food, you have given water, shelter, clothing to the least of these my brethren. What is that? That is works. Can't you read the Bible? The problem with you, with some of you is that you can read, you can understand, but you don't believe. That's your problem. You think you read these words and, and say, you know, verse 34, then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He says, why? 35, for I was hungered. You see, Jesus is giving the reason why he's asking them to enter the kingdom. Because, for I was in hunger. And he gave me meat. I was thirsty. He gave me drink. I was a stranger and he took me in. It's a works-based salvation. There's absolutely no sorry, doubt about that in the tribulation. And at the second coming of Jesus Christ, at the judgment of the nations, at the judgment of the nations, the most important thing to note is that the sheep and goats are divided based on the treatment of the Jews, based on works, based on works, what they have done for the Jews or what they have not done for the Jews. So that's very clear. And now, once you get a clear understanding of this, that at the second coming of Jesus Christ, the two most important events would be Armageddon, and then the judgment of nations. Now you have pretty much understood the most important things about the tribulation and the second coming of Jesus Christ. The most, the, the major events, the most important things you have understood if so far you have been following us in this Bible study. Of course, there is a lot more to talk about and we are going to look at it. But before that, once again, let us turn back to Matthew 24. Let us turn back to Matthew 24 and from verses 30, verse 32 onwards, Jesus Christ talks about some very important things that we need to know about the second coming. Look at verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. Jesus Christ is talking about the timing of all these things that are going to take place especially the timing of the second advent a lot of christians have learned this especially from the from the fundamental baptist that there are absolutely no signs for the rapture of the church 
they forget that all the signs for the second coming of Jesus Christ also become signs for the rapture of the church for the very simple reason that those signs do not begin in the tribulation they have already begun here in the church age we can see the signs of the times like I've said in one of my previous Bible studies we like my professor used to say we are living in the times of the signs already the signs for the second coming of Jesus Christ have already begun here in the church age at the end of the church age where we are in right now so there are signs and clear signs are given in the Bible for the second coming of Jesus Christ Jesus himself is saying learn learn a parable of the fig tree now we are going to look at this and see what Jesus Christ is going to teach us from this uh, verse now the fig tree very clearly in the Bible is a reference to Israel the fig tree first appears in Genesis chapter 3 Adam and Eve have realized that they are naked so what do they do they take the leaves of a fig tree and sew themselves aprons to cover their nakedness and from then on uh, fig leaves become a type or a picture of self-righteousness self-righteousness and if you read the, uh, what Paul says in the book of Romans he says that the main problem with Israel is self-righteousness and in the Old Testament there are many times when Israel is compared to a fig tree Israel is compared to a fig tree uh, like in the book of Zechariah you find a reference to Israel as a fig tree in the book of Amos I'm sorry and in Jeremiah let's look at Jeremiah 24 Jeremiah 24 we'll read verse 5 Jeremiah 24 verse 5 thus saith the Lord the God of Israel like these good figs so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good look at verse 7 and I will give them an heart to know me that I am the Lord and they shall be my people and I will be their God for they shall return unto me with their whole heart verse 8 and as the evil figs which cannot be eaten they are so evil surely thus saith the Lord so will I give Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes and the residue of Jerusalem that remain in this land and them that dwell in the land of Egypt so this is just one example of how God compares Israel with good and bad faiths but uh, the thing is remember when Adam and Eve covered themselves with the fig leaves they were doing something by themselves to cover their own nakedness instead of throwing themselves at the mercy of God so it's a type of self-righteousness I can save myself I can cover myself I can do myself that's self-righteousness so that's what Adam and Eve had self-righteousness when they covered themselves with fig leaves so fig leaves become a type of uh, self-righteousness later on fig, figs and fig tree uh, is compared to Israel and Paul says that Israel did not attain to the righteousness of God be, uh, righteousness of God because of their own righteousness so everything about the fig tree right now is to do with Israel and self-righteousness and rejecting the righteousness of God who is the Lord Jesus Christ so that much is very clear now look at Matthew 21 Matthew 21 we'll read verses 19 and 20 Matthew 21 19 and 20 and when he saw a fig tree in the way he came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only and said unto it let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever and presently the fig tree withered away and when the disciples saw it they marveled saying how soon is the fig tree withered away <clears throat> again it's a type of God cursing Israel for being uh, an unfruitful nation that did not bring forth fruit meat for repentance remember when John the Baptist preached when Jesus preached they said repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand 
And John said very clearly, bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. And they did. Why do you think Jesus cursed the fig tree? You think Jesus had such a short temper that when he didn't find fruit and he went ahead and cursed the tree in spite of that uh, you know, being so irrational for him to do? That would have been a very irrational thing for Jesus Christ to do. There is no fruit there. That's not the tree's fault. How could he get angry with it? It's got nothing to do with his hunger, nothing to do with uh, his eating food. It's to do with the fig tree being a, a picture of Israel, unfruitful, self-righteous Israel. Okay, and uh, it, and Israel is also like the salt that lost its saltiness. But praise God, at the end of the tribulation, this cursed fig tree will once again bear fruit, and the salt which lost its saltiness will become salty again. That's because God can do that with Israel because of the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. Well, so Israel is the fig tree. That's the first thing you must understand here in verse 32. Uh, it says, now learn a parable of the fig tree. That means when you look at Israel, there is something that you can learn about the second coming. What is it that Jesus is talking about? When his branch is yet tender, when his branch is yet tender, this is clearly a reference to Israel becoming a nation once again in 1948. The branch is tender. The branch is tender here. That means Jesus is clearly saying this, that when you see Israel once again growing as a tree know that it's a sign for the second coming of Jesus Christ now if Israel becoming a nation in 1948 is a sign for the second coming of Jesus Christ it certainly would be a sign for the uh, for, for the rapture of the church think about all these amillennialists and postmillennialists who never believed that you know, God is going to deal with Israel once again. How foolishly they still hold on to that view in spite of what God did right before their eyes. Israel had not been a nation for almost 2,000 years from AD 70 onwards when Rome destroyed Jerusalem. From AD 70 to 1948, almost 2,000 years, Israel was not a nation. And they, like the Roman Catholics, believe the amillennialists and uh, the postmillennialists believe like uh, the Roman Catholics that God is done with Israel and suddenly in 1948 Israel becomes a nation fulfilling so many prophecies in the Old Testament they are so blind that they still do not see it they still continue in their self-imposed blindness they don't want to see the truth in the scripture they want to hold on to some false teachings taught by the reformers uh, who learned it from the Roman Catholic Church. That God is done with Israel. He's never going to deal with Israel as a nation again. You're wrong, my friend. You're absolutely wrong. You're a fool if you believe that. Search the scriptures. Rightly divide the word of truth and you will see what I'm saying is true. So 1948, the branch is tender. Secondly, look at what he says. And put it forth leaves. He puts forth leaves. You know what that means? Still no fruit. Still no fruit. Israel started growing once again from 1948 till today. It's bringing leaves again. You know what that is all talking about? As I've said, self-righteousness. Till today, Israel rejects the offer of God's righteousness, which is Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God is Jesus Christ, and Israel still rejects it. Still fruitless, unfruitful. But he goes ahead and says, when you see these two things, the branches tender and it put forth, uh, puts forth leaves, know that summer is nigh. Now that's an important thing for you to understand. Summer. 
What is this summer that Jesus Christ is talking about? Look at Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon. Chapter 2. Song of Solomon, chapter 2. And we read verses 8 to 13. Verses 8 to 13. The voice of my beloved. Behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. This is the bride talking about the bridegroom, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And she says this in verse 9. My beloved is like a robe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows, showing himself through the lattice. This is a clear reference to the rapture of the church. A very clear reference to the rapture of the church. Okay, so it's Jesus Christ who does not come down to the earth, but he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows showing himself through the lattice that's how jesus comes back when he comes back for the church he's not making a public appearance he comes into midair and there the church is caught up to meet the lord in the air remember that so this is a beautiful picture of the rapture of the church now look at what jesus says at the moment of the rapture verse 10 my beloved spake and said unto me rise up my love my fair one and come over that's what's going to happen at the rapture. Jesus Christ is going to come down with the, the, the voice of the archangel and with a shout. And he's going to say to us, come up hither. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Verse 11, look at what Jesus says to the bride. For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The winter, remember, winter is a time uh, of death in the sense that you know especially in those very cold countries where it snows all the plants die it's a, a time of death it's a time also of hibernation it's a time when nothing uh, you know really works the way it ought to it's a it's specially characterized by death and that's the the, the 2000 years that israel was not a nation the winter time for israel was the 2000 years that Israel was not a nation. So he says, the winter is past. The winter is over. The fig tree is budding again. It's putting forth leaves. The, the branch is tender. The winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The rain here would certainly be a reference to the early rains. The early rains after winter and the springtime. And it would be a reference especially to the Philadelphian church age from 1500 to 1900. That's when the rain came from God, spiritually of course, because that's the time the King James Bible was translated. That's the time uh, missionaries took the King James Bible and went to all uh, the corners of the earth preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was a time of great rain, great showers of blessing upon the earth. So he says, the, for lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds has come. It is springtime. And the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. But look at this. Verse 13. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs. Remember when Jesus said in Matthew 24, there's, there was only a tender branch and leaves. But now... When the church is being raptured, the next thing for you to keep your eyes open to see would be the fruitfulness of Israel. Israel begins to bear fruit. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit is now once again ready to deal with the Jews. He has been dealing with Gentiles for 2000 years. But now there is going to be a shift. Just as there was a shift from God dealing specifically with the Jews to God turning to the Gentiles. Now there's going to be another shift. God's dealing with the Gentiles will be less in comparison to God, uh, God's dealing with the Jews. He's going to once again exclusively deal with the Jews in the tribulation. That's why this is called the time of Jacob's trouble, Daniel's 70th week. So there's going to be fruit, he says. Again, the fig tree is a reference to Israel. Verse 13, 
the fig tree put it forth a green face. All right, they are green figs. So when the rapture takes place, Israel will once more be a nation, according to this verse. And will have begun producing fruit as a nation, uh, and not just as a dispersed people all over the face of the earth. And the wines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. The church is going to be raptured in this uh, passage that we have just read. And the time when the church is going to be raptured is compared to springtime. Springtime. But immediately after springtime is going to be summer. The scorching heat of summer is compared or it is a picture of the tribulation. So going back to Matthew 24 verse 32, Jesus says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree, when its branch is yet tender, and put it forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. When you see Israel become a nation, know for sure that the tribulation is nigh, it is near. Isn't that wonderful to see how Jesus Christ gives us a sign to look forward to and that greatest sign for the second coming of Jesus Christ is the formation of Israel as a nation in 1948. The Lord willing in the next Bible study this coming Sunday, if you are still here on the earth, we are going to study something else in Matthew 24 which is very very important for you to learn and understand. But today I hope and pray that this has become clear to you that Jesus Christ gives us a sign for the second coming. The sign for the second coming in verse 32 of Matthew 24 is the fig tree, which is a reference to Israel. When you see the fig tree uh, having a tender branch, that means Israel has been a nation for a very short period of time, since 1948. It is still tender. It is putting forth green leaves. But very soon, according to Song of Solomon chapter 2, you will see some fruit green figs, the beginning of bearing of uh, fruit in Israel will be seen by the church. At that moment, know for sure Jesus Christ is going to say, Arise my love, my fair one, and come away. The church is going to be raptured. But immediately after the rapture of the church will be summer, the great tribulation that's coming upon the earth. Brethren, praise God. We who have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior will be among them who will be raptured. There is not going to be any partial rapture of the church as some people teach based on Hebrews 9.28. Now that's a misunderstanding of the book of Hebrews. There's going to be no partial rapture. Every born again Christian will be raptured to meet the Lord in the air. And we will be delivered from this terrible period of time known as the time of Jacob's trouble. We will not go through the tribulation, praise God, but we will go and stand before the judgment seat of Christ in the third heaven. Where we will be judged for the works that we have done as Christians after we have trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. That's why we need to be ready to meet the Lord in the air, to face Him and to be judged for all that we have done for Jesus Christ. When we do good works for the sake of Jesus Christ and not with ulterior selfish motives, we will be rewarded. And those rewards are very, very important for us to have in eternity. But for those who have never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they would be left behind on this earth to go through the tribulation, where the Antichrist will force everybody to take a mark in their hands or in their forehead. And if you do not take that mark, then you will not be able to buy anything to eat. You will not be able to do any work. You will not be able to sell anything, do any business whatsoever. And you will be a fugitive. And you will be hunted down and you will be persecuted if you do not take the mark of the beast. But if you do, the Bible says that you will be cast into a lake of fire where you will burn forever and ever without Jesus Christ. But even if you do trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior in this tribulation time, you might have to die for your faith because uh, if you 
uh, do not take the mark of the beast, you will not be able to feed yourselves and your family. You have to see your family die before you and you may have to die yourself as a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ. But all that can be avoided if you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today so that you may also be raptured and be delivered from this terrible time that's coming upon the earth. A lot of Christians don't like it when preachers talk like this. They say, you cannot scare somebody into believing in Jesus Christ. Well, yes, we can. Paul said, right, by all means that we may save some. It is better that you fear than are afraid because it's very true. The wrath of God is very true. It's not something to be trifled with. It's not something, you know, we don't preach a God uh, who is only love. We preach a God who is love, who is also holiness and justice. That's why we preach the judgment and the wrath of God. And you must tremble before this God. You must tremble before his wrath and escape it with your life by trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Be afraid and trust Jesus Christ as your savior. Otherwise, you're going to go through this terrible time, most fearsome time the world has ever known or will ever know. But remember this, Jesus died for your sins. He paid the penalty for your sins. He took the punishment for your sins. He shed his blood on the cross for your sins. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses three and four, that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and then on the third day it rose up according to the scriptures. If you believe this and trust Jesus Christ as your savior, you will be saved, you will be born again, you will be a part of the body of Christ. And Jesus Christ is coming back very soon for his body. And he's going to rapture the church and take the church to be with him forever. And you will be in that number. My prayer is that you will trust Jesus Christ as your savior right now. All right, we are going to take a, a short break of five minutes and then we're going to come back for uh, the sermon. Thank you. But uh, let me also remind you this, that you need to stop this live stream and then when you get a notification for the next live stream, then you click on it and you'll be able to join us for the live streaming of the sermon. Thank you. God bless you.